welcome to all of you it's my great pleasure to welcome professor aguilar accompanied by his wife and uh, professor aguilar is somebody the library knows well he had visited us earlier and had given a wonderful talk on the presence of jesuits in tibet and he is the director of research school of divinity and director of the center for the study of religion and politics from st mary's college university of st andrews he has just this morning given me this book a wonderful book that he has written on the present pope pope francis and uh, there he, it says that professor regular is <laughs> Chilean theologian, now a professor of religion and politics at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He has written extensively on the church in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, including Cardinal Real Silva Henry Cuts, uh, Presencia en la Vida de Chile, 1907-1999, and a social history of the catholic church in chile nine volumes he is a camel dolles benedictive oblate and has lived in scotland for the past 20 years and the talk that he is giving today is on the three monastic seats of learning in tibet serendipity and ganden all the many of us especially the tibetans might feel that uh, what is there to talk about the three seats of learning because they are so well known to all of us but i think this is a wonderful topic because these three seats of learning of tibet tibet used to have more than 6000 monasteries most of which is now razed to the ground and completely destroyed by the coming of the uninvited guest in tibet but out of which the three monastic seats of learning really equaled the nalanda monastic universities in fact these major monastic universities are great centers for academia and in fact they are all modeled on great indian universities like nalanda takshishila vikram shila and so on in fact if you read the the most famous tibetan translator thumisambota there is a clear account of his visit to india and uh, explaining about these three monastic seats and so on in exile the tibetans were able to reestablish many of these monasteries that were destroyed in tibet or in a very precarious situation so the three monastic seats are established and are fully functioning and if we spend just two minutes reflecting about the contributions that has been made by this great monastic institutions the kind of academic excellence that has been produced and the education that has been imparted by this monastic institutions did not limit only in tibet there was so much appreciation about this monastic institutions academic studies and the fame grown far and wide people from china used to come to study from mongolia used to come to study the russian republics like tuva kalmukia aginsky moscow st petersburg then all the areas in himalayan region like bhutan nepal arunachal pradesh they used to come to study in tibet having replaced or restored these three monastic institutions once again in tibet once again even though we are in exile and living as refuge but still we are again continuing the same tradition of imparting this wonderful knowledge to all these people coming from kalmuk tuva there are hundreds and hundreds of students studying for many many years and the students are from all these 
Himalayan regions and from Mongolia and now some Indians also. Now we have a number of foreigners also. And to make a long story short, what is being studied in these monastic institutions are really the core values of a human being. In my talks giving to the students from the Gurukul, I was repeatedly saying that what in our tradition try to teach is really to explore the most profound inner resources which is so much demand in today's world. Because today everybody is going more and more outside and trying to fulfill their aspiration and so-called happiness by material accumulations at the cost of destroying the whole environment and the natural resources. And it is because of such a crucial juncture that I think what is being taught in these monastic institutions should be regarded with high esteem and value. And I therefore thank you for choosing this topic because I know you have really seen the value of these monastery institutions. This morning I was trying to get hold of a book talking about the three monastery institutions, but there were so many things there. But I came across a letter the Tibetan government once sent to Chiang Keshak in 1946. An interesting letter in which the, this religious national pride of Tibetan culture and its importance was con clearly conveyed in that letter by saying that there are many great nations on this earth who have achieved unprecedented wealth and might, which is still true today. But there is only one nation which is dedicated to the well-being of humanity in the world, and that is the religious land of Tibet, which cherishes a joint spiritual and temporal system, which not only is true at that time, but is still very much true today. Despite of Tibetans having lost everything, but the one thing that they are you know, trying to hold on to is this hum inner human values. Guided by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Tibetans are as much as possible trying to hold on to these values, seeing it as importance. And the, all the 10 subjects that is being studied in Tibet, in, and especially in these monastery institutions, deal with ontology, logic, epistemology, morality, metaphysics, moral values, discipline, human values, which is really, as I said earlier, becoming a rare commodity in today's world. So it will be not only interesting, but will be extremely insightful and uh, encouraging to once again revisit the contribution made by these great monastery institutions. So thank you for coming to talk to us and sharing your insight on this uh, topic. Thank you very much. So I uh, give the floor to you now. Thank you, Geshe Lakdor. <clears throat> it is always a very humbling and wonderful experience to, to come to Dharamsala and to you. As you said, um, there is today uh, with me a group of my, I would say, former students as well. And for us in, in Europe and the United States, uh, the monasteries and the Tibetan thought about humanity and about life has become a much needed contribution to our lives as well. I want to open the, the talk by simply suggesting that we should always remember when we talk about the, the three monasteries, the dens assume that there is one paragraph from Santideva, which probably motivated all these wonderful men and women who even today continue the teachings of the Buddha. 
And this is taken from one of his works. And it says, for as long as space endures, and as long as the world endures, so long I shall abide to dispel the sufferings of the world. The monasteries came about with the development of Tibetan Buddhism. And the great founder of, in a sense, the development of the monasteries was a monk called Tsongkhapa. So I am talking here about the development of these three big monasteries from 1409 until the 19th century. As Geshe Lakdor correctly said, these monasteries after the um, uninvited guests came into Tibet, suffered enormously, were destroyed, um, they were reopened, but um, they came to, to India, but they never regained, in a way, the sense of numbers and the sense of scholarship of that time. I would argue in all my talks about the monasteries of Tibet that I have no authority to tell Tibetans what to do. I am not a Tibetan. I am a friend of Tibet. But if I look at our own institutions in Europe and the Tibetan institutions, it is actually to monasteries and to people who dedicate their lives to others, to knowledge, and to understand humanity that we always turn. As I see lots of young people this afternoon, I think it is a must for all of us always to return to what they are called in history the golden moments. And the golden moments are always moments related to communities of learning and communities of meditation and prayer. Now, let me tell you a few secrets so that you understand my approach to this material this afternoon. Historians of Tibet in the West, if you want to call it, are divided in three types. I, am, I belong to one type, but you will realize why I am saying the things I'm going to say. We look at history and we interpret history. We call it historiography. We go back and simply interpret things that we cannot see ourselves through documents and through other means. They are good historians of Tibet who deal with the political history of Tibet. I, will, I think it would be politically incorrect of me to talk about some of my colleagues. But they are historians and who produce large volumes and very competent volumes on the history of Tibet in which the monasteries have seven pages of the volumes. And the importance is on the change of governments, on the importance of the unification of Tibet under the fifth Dalai Lama. Um, then they jump from the fifth to the 13th Dalai Lama. And then they look at the changes that may be impeded the progress of Tibet at that time. So be aware of that. Competent works, but they deal with politics. There is a second that we will call within our scholarly groups, the historians of Buddhism. And the historians of Buddhism are, will be looking at texts that developed um, from the Indian texts that permeated into a large part of Buddhism and then form some of the competent works that these monasteries will be using in order to understand thought causality, epistemology, religious life, and politics. I belong to the third type. This is a very rare type. And the three types don't like each other. The third type believes that they are the religious institutions that make a country. And therefore, we are prone to study societies and histories in which Monks, religious people, um, hermits, nuns, and so on, have an enormous role to play. Within that history, then, the sources are different than the first and second type. 
The first type will look at colonial archives, so they will be looking at the colonial office in India. They will be looking at manuscripts available in the Chinese colonial archives. They will be looking at tangible pieces of paper where they can use to reconstruct history. The second type, historians of Buddhism, will be looking at texts. We'll be looking at how then maybe the issue of reincarnation was developed by one author or the other. Do you reincarnate forcefully? Or, like these monasteries, you suggest that you want to return in order always to help others. What is the role of the sentient beings? Uh, what is the role of the plants? What is the role of religion? The third type, and that's why we are very few, and that's why I'm professor of religion and politics, believe that the politics and the religion go together. It is impossible to understand a political institution without understanding religious institutions and vice versa. But be aware that I do not work only with colonial archives. I think there is an enormous sense of a diversity of sources for the history of the monasteries. Yes, the archives of an old Tibet and the archives of the India colonial office or the archives today available in Lhasa through the Chinese Academy of Science. But there are other sources, and the other sources are the ones, for example, that speak of the biography of Tsongkhapa, the intellectual and spiritual father of these three monasteries. These are documents which have been transcribed through interviews, oral interviews, or archives that have been produced through the visions of monks. Monks have visions, have dreams, have the sense of a metaphysical world that they can understand. The historians of the first type will say, we cannot reach that kind of stage, therefore they are, not, they are of no importance. So they will discard, discard tankas, mandalas, archives and monasteries, or the writings of the Dalai Lamas. They will suggest that the testament of the 13th Dalai Lama is a testament that has very little value to understand history. It is just one person saying that. In my own work, I take the three types together, and so I work with all the, with all the uh, materials available. I believe that, for example, when you look at the founder of the monasteries, we do not have certain letters of Tsongkhapa. Ink and pen were barely available at that time. So we need to rely on tradition, and we need to rely on the tradition of disciples who actually founded the monasteries and, and so forth. I make this clarification simply because some of the statements about the monasteries could be considered dubious in the historiographical sense of the history of monasteries in which uh, visions and other metaphysical documents are not taken into account. So, for example, I, I give you a, a quote from the first type without disclosing the author. And this person, one of the best historians of politics in Tibet, suggests that while religious priority was universally accepted, the definition of what benefited religion was often contested. So this is an outside view in that it seems that religion is accepted, but the benefits of religion are contested. I find impossible to agree with this agreement from 1409, I think, with the difficulties of politics, with the difficulties of different monasteries, it is very, very clear that I would assume in my writing of history of Tibet that most Tibetans had a religious practice and that most of them were extremely fond of their monks and that they had parts of their traditional religion but that every Tibetan household said their prayers, their offerings, and so on at all times. So it is impossible to understand the monasteries without understanding Tibet of the 15th century. When the monasteries are created, there is a change between some kind of diversity 
into a unification of authority. Geshe Lakhtar, please scold me after if I say something that is wrong. This is, I know that this is a topic which is not easy. But we have a very old tradition of Buddhism, the Kadampa, the Kadamas is called, and Tsongkhapa decides to suggest that he is unhappy about the practice of Tibetan Buddhism at that time, that more study needs to be done, more debating, and at the same time that all monks need to remain celibate within their monasteries. So, in terms of European religious history, this is called a religious reform. There is a reformer who reinvents the ideas of what it is to acquire merit and to become a monk within the Tibetan Buddhist system. So, for those of you who are not familiar with this, there are several religious orders. This is not the topic of my talk. But Tsongkhapa creates such a strong religious order, the Gelugpa, that with the construction of the three major monasteries and the amounts of monks plus the discipline of the studying, the celibacy, and the debating, this becomes the central monasteries then, at least in central Tibet. Once the political scene of Tibet progresses, then the head of this religious order from the time of the third Dalai Lama, and when the Khans give the name Dalai Lama to the head of the order, then they become the central unified authority within Tibet. That's why I say this could be a controversial topic. But the monastery certainly sits as some of the most important. They are called the three seats because they concentrate the ritual power of Tibet. So if in 1409, then the monastery of Ganden is founded by Tsongkhapa, with the foundation then of Sera and Deprung, there are a few developments that are central to understand the unification and the religious institu institutions of Tibet. Tsongkhapa unified Tibet by building these monasteries around the capital city of Lhasa. He created then, who was a man of great intellect, he created the yearly festival, the prayer festival of Tibet, where then Tibet will every year, in the new year, over a period of several weeks be consecrated to Buddhism once again. The schools of Buddhism, the variety of the Gladampa, the Sakyapa, the Kayupa, the Salupa, and the Yonampa became then associated and integrated within a unified Tibet. Let's look at what makes the monasteries important within the intellectual history of a unified Tibet. He studied, Tsongkhapa studied and reflected on a very interdisciplinary sense of monastic studies. In a way, when one as an outsider looks at the subjects studied in the three main monasteries over the centuries, one realizes how much the monks must have been stretched in their study. So, they study monastic discipline and history of monasticism, the perfection of wisdom teachings, logical philosophy, rhetoric and debating, tantric cycles, medicine, religious chanting, and dancing. Tsongkhapa had been trained particularly in the mystic practices of concentrated meditation upon the great divinities, and he felt that this was a new knowledge. That's why, bear with me, this is challenged by others. But Tsongkhapa certainly suggested that the corpus that the monks were studying was a new kind of, 
of knowledge was not a continuation from the Kadam. The teachings then progressively in Tsongkhapa advanced to the relation between teachers and students, and he called then this new Kadampa the Kadam Sarma. One must ask in writings of history, was this new? Was this a reform? Was this something that was about to happen because of the disorder in the monasteries? Remember that at that time, not only Tsongkhapa will say that the monasteries were disorderly in their discipline and their study, but there was the whole problem of the feudal lords, the problem of land, and the problem of uh, a kind of divided government at all. Tsongkhapa was a very prolific writer, and his contributions tend to philosophy and hermeneutics. So new stages of what you could call the progression of Tibetan Buddhism. The Lam Rim Chen Mo, one of my favorite texts, is one of those, the greatest position of the stages of the path, was one of those that certainly made a complete difference to the building and the development of these new communities. He commented extensively on Nagarjuna's uh, works, 1407-1408, wrote texts on Buddhist hermeneutics, such as the essence of eloquence. So what arose out of this founding of the monasteries was certainly a unified Tibet, un um, unified through the Great Prayer Festival, and the Jokang, the Lhasa Cathedral, in which every year then there was the rededication of Tibet. Now, the monasteries had some complexity. I shall only say a few words about this. We tend to see later monasteries as large units of monks, which seems to do the same, at least in the monastic reforms of Europe in the 15th and 16th century. It seems that monks work and pray within the monastery, but they have, in a sense, the same aspirations. In the writings of existent on the development of the monasteries, there was always a change, a very, a very extraordinary change, between monks who were admitted very young into the monasteries, who were going to remain in the monastery at all times. Monks then who came young to the monastery, but were then trained for the civil administration of Tibet. From already the 16th century, there were 14 places for civil servant monks for the Lhasa government that came from these monasteries. Much later, they were the fighting monks, the ones who defended the discipline and the monasteries from the outside time. In the whole literature, there is, a, there is a kind of monks that is missing, which were the hermits. The hermits were monks that from time to time were on their own, on the hills, on the mountains, and remained there for a significant number of time. The monastery of Ganden Nampar, in Sanskrit Tushita, was assumed then as the first one, where the order then, called at that time the Ganden Pa, later assumed as the Gelugpa, it started following then the tradition of Bhutan, the master of Salu, and adopted a ceremonial yellow hat. All monks before in Tibet had red hats. Ganden Monastery became the major monastery through the times, and in Ganden then, after the 16th century, there was a special place where Dalai Lamas could come, members of the government could come. From the beginning, there was a strict rules of monastic living, and at the same time, there was 
some kind of division between the aims of the monastery and the aims of the Tibetan government. Through the whole history of the monasteries, the monasteries had the power to remind the Tibetan government at times of things that were not going well. The disciples of Tsongkhapa continued then the tradition of the monasteries so that Drepung already had been founded in 1416 by Jamian Chorje Tache Palden, one of Tsongkhapa's disciples, and with a different kind of standard of learning than the others, so they became known, known as the Nalanda of Tibet, referring to the Nalanda Monastery of India. Within Drepung, the Ganden Podang was built in 1518 by the second Dalai Lama, and this particular abode became associated with the residence of the Dalai Lamas until the construction of the Potala Palace in Lhasa by the fifth Dalai Lama. So you can see how the monasteries evolved in a very diverse Tibet, but they become then the sign of the unity of Tibet, allied then from the fifth Dalai Lama to places connected to Lhasa and to the Potala. So the highest learning in Drepung, the first monastery, Ganden, and then Sera. Sera was built in the vicinity of Lhasa. It became then the called desert seat among the dense Asum Sendegrasum, an abbreviation of the first syllable of each one of the three monasteries. Now, one question for the historians here. Did Tsongkhapa intend to found only three monasteries that were of importance? Did this happen because of the highest learning that was happening there? Was this something that developed as it should have developed? So Tsongkhapa has seven disciples. And the first Dalai Lama was one of his disciples. Most probably they are, there is a controversy here, most probably the first Dalai Lama was a nephew of Tsongkhapa who studied at Ganden. Because these are again oral traditions through the monasteries, the first type of historians will not take that seriously. I do. I would be interested on Geshe Lakdor's and others' views on was he then related to the first Dalai Lama. There was a fourth Geluk monastery, Geluk monastery, which was quite important, Ashilump, in Sang, and became then the fourth most important among the Geluk. But with the centrality of Lhasa, then it became the fourth. It's not that we have four important monasteries, we have three, a fourth, and the others. The foundation then of the knowledge in the monasteries. The political development of the three seats offered then a home to the first, the second, and the third Dalai Lamas. With the, with the naming of the third Dalai Lama and the conferring of the title Dalai Lama by the Khans, the arrival of the Khans army and the military power and religious power then of the third Dalai Lama, there is the whole centering of this. So it is that we could say that from 1642 onwards, there is the very importance of the three monasteries related to the government of Lhasa and to the fifth Dalai Lama. What happened to the other orders? The other orders continued their monasteries, continued in a sense challenging the Gelugpa, but they were not able to convince then the centralized government led by the Dalai Lamas that these three monasteries were not the center of the nation. They were members of the nobility who created incidents here and there, attacked the monasteries, 
there are some uh, aspects of Tibetan history which are quite violent in the 16th and 17th century. But with the enthronement of the fifth Dalai Lama, then the monasteries became the heart of the nation. The great fifth was taken in 1622 to Deprung Monastery, where he spent most of his life under his master, Ligme Shapdung Konchun Chopel, and he was influenced then by the first Panchen Lama. There was at this time an opposition by the Karmapa, the Red Hats, their patron, the King of Sang. The Great Fifth then used again the protection of Wu Khan, and the army then that helped the Fifth Dalai Lama once again defeated the King of Sang and unified Tibet once again in 1642. Now, let me make a connection with the 6th, the 7th, the 8th, and the 9th Dalai Lama. Over that period, there was a very clear division still between what it was a religious practice and what was political power. So the 5th Dalai Lama was the head of the nation in the Potala Palace, with the ritual festival at the Jokan, with the sense that this was Tibet itself, but still religious practices were at the center, so that less importance was given to negotiations with other nations, very few foreigners came into Tibet, and at the same time, those who serve in the parliament and in the government, of course, were not elected. They belonged to several families or monasteries. So monasteries will elect whoever was going to serve and train them to work the government. The monasteries evolved from being one single unit when they were small into, it's the only, it's the only metaphor I could find, into being like British colleges, universities such as Oxford and Cambridge. They were colleges, we were a collection of colleges, and each college then had an abbot, and the abbots connected with themselves, but these were independent monasteries within the monasteries. They had some characteristics, and this is what I want to develop in my history of Tibet. It is fascinating that the different colleges, while they belonged to the same order, they were monks from a particular region. So you have from the Kampa region or the Ambo region, you will have the same monks coming to a particular college. There were people coming from Mongolia, so there was a college of only people from Mongolia. And there was an anomaly, especially within Sera. Sera had, during the 16th century, four colleges. There were two colleges that were vacant. They did not have monks, but they remained then as part of the monastery, they, was, they weren't closed or evolved. Now, numbers of monks, and here is where I appreciated um, the introduction by Geshe Lakhtar. These are huge numbers for the standards of monastic life today in the whole world. I was trying to think with my wife there, how many Benedictines in the Catholic tradition are there? I, I would be completely wrong if I say more than 5,000 in the world, and they are very powerful in different countries. 1694, these are archives from the monasteries that the first uh, type of historians will not take seriously, I do. 1694, there were 97,528 monks, monks in central Tibet and Kham. 97,000 monks. In 1733, and, um, and with the flourishing then of the unification of Tibet, peace, and so on, there were 319,270 monks who have taken the monastic initiation. Monks were perceived then of higher status than lay people, and many families then gave a son to the monastery between the ages of 7 to 10. Monks were divided into two groups. Those who were pursuing higher studies, known, known as Pegawa, the readers, and those who did not, 
but could read and chant their prayers. For example, in the May College of Sera Monastery, only 800 of the 2,800 monks in the 18th century, that's 29% were readers. This is understandable. The highest learning of the monasteries, the back of Tibet, the center of Tibetan life, and the backbone of a spiritual wealth for the government. But most people, lay people in their houses and their homes, needed the monk to come and chant prayers. They did not need the higher learning. So only 29% were acquiring the higher learning. The non-readers worked for the monastery and lived off the daily distributions and tea offered after the collective prayers, prayer sessions. The monasteries were organized through semi-independent units, the Tratsang. As I said, they acted as colleges. Monks were admitted to the Tratsang and they acted within that unit rather than the whole general monastery. The Tratsang had abbots and were divided into Kamtsen. The Kamtsen were residential units where the monks belonged, kept their few possessions, their books, and so forth. The three seats, and this has been an interesting discovery in all this, did not have an abbot at that time. They were run communally by an executive standing committee, so that a monk's loyalty in the 19th and 19th century was not to Sera, Drepung, or Gandal, but it was primarily to Kamsan at the college level, where he was growing in his knowledge with other monks. Notice that this creates a problem for the whole issue of government, nobility, and those who are opposing the power of the monasteries because the central government needs to look at problems with the monasteries through a committee rather than through an abbot. The abbot that comes later into the monasteries is able to say, I represent the voice of this monastery, therefore you deal with me. There are, I have a few minutes left. There are some interesting and, and funny vignettes here. I'm, I'm sorry, Geshe Lakdar. I, I need to put some humor into the afternoon as well. The greatest controversy during the fifth, the great fifth, among the monks was the place of sitting during the Mong Lam Chen Mo festival at the annual prayer. All the monks came at different days. They stayed with families. They were fed. This was the height of the year in Lhasa. So, of course, we are all human beings. And therefore, the monks started challenging, why was it that the monks from Ganden at the beginning were sitting in the best places? They wanted to sit in the best places in order to be closer to the Dalai Lama and closer to the main festivals. And so there were so many monks that they did not fit into the Jokan or the streets nearby. So there were no tickets, as in our time, there was no ordering. So a great controversy was brought to the to the fifth Dalai Lama, suggesting the monks were unhappy about their sitting places. So, the great prayer began on the fourth day of the first month of the Tibetan year. For those of you who are not familiar with this, let me say a word, and then I'll tell you what was the solution of the fifth Dalai Lama. The Tibetan year contains 12 lunar months, each month made of 30 days, a fact that made the lunar Tibetan calendar different than the solar year. Thus, in order to compensate with other calendars, Tibetan added an extra month every three years in order to correlate the solar and the lunar calendars. Those of you who are confused can go and study this after. This is, this is very trying for a scholar to understand the Tibetan year. As a result, then, the first month of the, of the Tibetan year fell within February and March, and corresponded to a cycle of farming activities. Within the Tibetan year and in each month, the first, eighth, and fifteenth days were devoted to religious observances in the annual festival. There's a wonderful book that I'm sure is in the library by Hugh Richardson on the liturgical year of probably the only one we have 
describing every day what happens in Lhasa. However, to add to the complex calculation of months and dates, all inauspicious days could be omitted and replaced by the duplication of other auspicious days. The calendar cycle had 12 years, each one of them designated with the, na with the name of an animal in the following order, mouse, ox, tiger, hare, dra dragon, snake, horse, sheep, monkey, bird, dog, and pig. So, by the time that we have this controversy and the monasteries are at their highest strength in peace with the central administration and the fifth Dalai Lama, we have a year in which then the cycle, the 60-year cycle known as Rakchun, a completed cycle, or the Lokam, the year element, had been introduced. So as to add to the complexity of the Tibetan year, then um, an animal was assigned to each animal of this calendar, was assigned one of the five elements, Kam. Fire, water, earth, iron, and wood, in that order. Each element covers two animal years in succession, one designated as male, the next female. The 60-year cycle begins with the fire female hair year. So, during the fourth day of the first month, monks from the three seats and other monasteries arrive in Lhasa in greater numbers, estimated during the 20th century as 20,000. A large number of them sat at the Jokang and stayed the night at temples, shops, and private homes. The great prayer took place on the sixth day with the long day prayer on the fifth day. Three main services of two hours each took place on the sixth day with two services in the morning and one in the afternoon. So the problem arose because Songkapa, in all his wisdom, had never given a, a proper hierarchical system to the Gelugpa or to any, anybody belonging to the three monasteries. So, because Ganden was the first monastery, then they were seated first. They were a kind of primos inter pares. The solution, and I love this, the great theft decided to put order among these monks who were rioting for the seat, suggesting that he will write what is called a short introduction entitled Guidelines for Seating Arrangements at the Monlan Chenmo Festival of Lhasa. And that was the end. There were never more complaints, but the rearranging of the seats, I haven't asked Geshe Lakdor of which monastery he feels more close, but the rearrangements of the seating of monks within the reign of the fifth Dalai Lama, suggested that the hierarchy of sitting had Deprung, not Ganden, in the first places. So you had Deprung Monastery first. You could then have in between the Ganden Monasteries, but then Sera Monastery was always at the end, which the commentators of all these times so yes, of course, they were sitting third. My own sense is that if you make a calculation through Hugh Richardson's books of what was Lhasa and the Yekong at that time, you will suggest that no way the, the Sera monks could ever sit anywhere. It was impossible. There was not enough place. So the three seats were given lands and serfs to work the land. And from the fifth Dalai Lama, Deprung acquired a central role by being given at all times the control then of Lhasa. It was a large portion of the monasteries with a regulated number of monks, the power to conscript monks among the children of the serfs, and government subsidies to poorer monasteries. Those subsidies included barley, butter, tea, and funding for ritual ceremonies. So let me just say a few words to finish, and as to allow questions, comments, and particularly help with this research. It is, it is not an issue research for me. From the unification of Tibet, then under the Great Fifth, there is a change. The Tibetan government became a secular power with 
a religious Buddhist ideology under the term Chusi Nitral, religion and political affairs joined together before they were completely separated. For Tibetans, and particularly for the monks of the three seats, the relation of the religious and the political was expressed in the same Ganden uh, Potran, that is the Tibetan government, is the head of the religion and the patron of the religion. Thus, during the reign of the fifth Dalai Lama, 16 Goran positions were created as to be filled by monks. They had never been in the Goran before. They were eventually known as token monks because they did not reside in the monasteries, and from age 14, they trained for the Tibetan civil service. The Gelugpa monasteries eligible to provide monks to the civil service were Sera, Drepung, Ganden, Riwadechen, Olamrin, Riwucholin, Ganden Cholin, Ganden Chokor, Chechok, Nandra, and Nechung. They needed to remain only a night or a week in a monastery, and therefore, as a result, the token monks did not have the same allegiance to the monasteries than the monks that resided in a monastery all their lives. I think I leave it there to keep time. Thank you very much for this very enlightening talk. And uh, I always have been encouraging the staffs in the library and also our younger Tibetan generation to listen to what outsiders are saying about us. You should not just be talking to yourself, but also see and watch what others have written about you, what others are saying about you, whether you're an individual or a center or an institution or monastery, it's always important to find out your strengths and your weaknesses. And also, if you, if you read the story, you will find many interesting things. Also, I, I once found a very interesting thing, you know, about the three monastic seats. Uh, once I asked a question that during one of the Great Barrier Festival meeting, since, you know, more than 10,000 monks and so forth come together, since there is no loudspeaker or no FM transmitter, so how would the monks are able to listen to the teaching <laughs> of His Holiness Dalai Lama or some great, you know, lamas? Then there was, oh, in those days the lamas have a big voice and things like that, you know. So I doubt about these things. So it's interesting to explore how all these things were, you know, executed and happened. There's a lot of things to learn about. And uh, it is especially important for the younger Tibetan generation to know about yourself and also to see what are our, what are, as I said, what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses. For example, His Holiness Dalai Lama is these days encouraging us, the Buddhists, to become Buddhists of the 21st century. And he has uh, encouraged us to uh, have science courses in the monastic universities. And in fact, one of the ma major projects that the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives is doing is teaching science in the monastic institutions. Now from this year, from, from this, in fact from this month, starting from the last month and then getting into the middle of this month, we have started the actual science study in the monastic universities, in the three monastic seats to start with. And it is the study of science has now become a regular part of the monastic study in addition to their religious and philosophical studies. And the purpose of asking the monks to study is not to make them scientists, but to make them conversant with science and with the modern knowledge so that you are able to, you know, uh, effectively share your knowledge and your experience to help improve the physical health and mental health of the suffering people all over the world. So your talk was a reminder of what we really need to focus and reflect and find our strengths and weaknesses. Thank you so much once again. And now I would open the floor and invite questions. I have two questions. Uh, one is what are the what were the doctrinal differences between the Kadam Sarpa and the Kadam Sarma and the Gelukpa? Were there any doctrinal differences? And secondly, you said that in the time of uh, the fifth Dalai Lama, the Gelukpa gained ascendancy over the Karmapas. 
So what was the process of uh, negotiation? You know, when one sect gains ascendancy over another, what were, how, yeah. how did that adjustment happen? The first question is a good one. There, there are no many writings on that. They were not doctrinal in a sense, but they were on the emphasis of monastic life. Tsongkhapa emphasizes the learning, the debating. If you go to any monastery and you have the debating, we are, we are in the land of the Gelugpa. Um, the texts they used were texts which advanced the hermeneutics of an understanding of cause and effect rather than doctrines. And so that's why you have so many masters among the, the Gelugpa who advanced the learning and what text they prefer. One of the questions um, that I have in my own research is, I'm working with a framework on teacher-disciple. You cannot understand any Buddhism without understanding that you need a teacher and a disciple. That's very clear. But then, most of the literature, particularly historical, if you are not interested in metaphysical things, suggest that everybody studies the same, and maybe the masters are for the only few. There is a contradiction in this. If you have Sera monasteries, the literature tells you that people study the same text. But then if you study some of the Tibetan historians, and at the same time you study some of the leading monks and geshes of those monasteries, you can see there is a difference in the text they emphasize. In the, in the aspect of a particular text they want to pass on to their disciples. Otherwise, you will not need teacher disciple. You will need the classroom. But what you have is, is really groups evolving in, in their understanding of different texts. So, to answer that question, the difference between the two is an emphasis on what you do as a monk. That's why the, the animosity, if, if, if that is the correct word, between the two movements in the 15th century is simply that they perceived the same aim of every Buddhist and every monk in a very different way. Now, with the, with the, um, with the fifth Dalai Lama, what it happens is that, yes, there was not a council. There were armies running. And so therefore, with the arrival of the Khans and the arrival of the title, and with backing then of the defeat of the king of Sang, then it is natural that in the land of Tibet, the orders, uh, in a sense, advance their ways of doing rather than ours. I know that today they live in peace and they're even represented in the administration. But they, like any other human family, I could think of, you know, the uh, Geshe Lagdor said there that I was, a, I was a Benedictine oblate. Yes, I am. Within the Benedictines, there are about 20 families and, you know, we don't like each other. It's normal. I prefer one way of organizing my prayer and somebody else likes something else. It's very normal. It's, uh, what, I, what I'm saying is, my criticism of the type one historian is that it tries to put everything together. No, these are all human beings who are trying to do their best in their way of life, and they will have disagreements and emphasis on different things. The wonderful thing that Tibet did, and that Thailand didn't manage, Sri Lanka did not manage, was actually to have a complete diversity of monasteries Without the suppression, I mean, the Gelugpa could have pushed, I think, particularly with the 5th and then the 13th, they could have pushed for the suppression of other monasteries. But the fact is that because the nobility, the nobility's power started disappearing, and the three university monasteries were there, it meant that the aims of Tibetan Buddhism and of Tibet did not become the suppression of anybody else. But you know, if you look at if you look at current years, there have been controversies between different schools of Tibet and Buddhism. That is quite normal. You know. Yeah. If I could ask you something slightly mm. off topic, uh, mm. I, I don't know much about this, but uh, how did the Rime evolve? You know, I've heard that it was a kind of reaction to the. How did they? The Rime. Yeah. That it was a kind of reaction to Gelugpa. 
There were several over the centuries, yes. But as I said, if you, if you take it, if you take it, let's take a Buddhist sense, cause and effect. If you take cause and effect, I am more concerned uh, positively with the diversity of the idea rather than with the cause. So that, in a way, Tibet profited from having more monks and the influence of the metaphysical sphere rather than not. That is important. So the effect is wonderful. The effect of the animosity of 14th, 15th, 16th century brings prosperity to Tibet. Because Tibetans have to ask, who are we, and how are we going to run our institutions? The type A historian is trying to get the dirt out of the fights of some place. I prefer to say the golden period of the fifth Dalai Lama is a golden period because Tibetans need to ask questions about themselves, need to ask questions, what is the relation with the Buddha, with learning, with text? Uh, they need to ask questions about the relation between a political institution with a religious institution. They need to ask questions even about that committee of the three monasteries. Does it work? Um, I, I haven't had access to many things. Uh, my Tibetan is poor. But there must be somewhere, if they were not destroyed in Lhasa, there must be some kind of manuscripts in which questions were asked, particularly to the fifth, about what to do about different matters. If the fifth was the great fifth, unified Tibet, is because he must have been asked about every aspect of life. And he will have consulted, he will have meditated, he will have read the scriptures, he will call the oracle, and he will have said, I think we should go this way. That is the importance in history. The historiography is constructed by looking at actually what is changing, what is happening. I'm less interested if the great fifth would have shouted at the minister or something. I'm interested in this development, which is a very strong development. Um, it will be important, for example, to relate the current monasteries with the old monasteries. I know there is a, there is a a natural breach because of the geographical season, but there must be the same, some continuity and some development. Um, uh, following from what Geshe Lakdor said previously, um, I'm not a Buddhist, so in my own tradition, you must look at the history of your tradition in order to understand what is happening now. You cannot just begin anew. You have to go there. My interest in Tsongkhapa and his um, reform comes from the fact that I could begin in the 16th century or 17th century. It would be much easier to begin with the fifth Dalai Lama and talk about only the golden period. But the fact that one returns once again to the writings on Tsongkhapa means that one sees there particular developments that affected then the monasteries later. I don't know if I answered your question. But yes. uh, sir, you started by historiography and talking about uh, two interpretations and then you belong to a third interpretation. Uh, stating that uh, you believe that religion and politics are inseparable in the context of Tibet. And uh, you also told us that in, under the reign of the fifth Dalai Lama, the leadership, the spiritual leadership and the political leadership was consolidated. Mm -hmm. So, to some extent, Buddhism was, was at a level that was unprecedented in, mm -hmm. in, the, political, in the political forum. Mm -hmm. So, what happens to the social status of non-Buddhists from the historian's perspective? Interesting question. Um, I have not worked on others apart from Catholics within Tibet at that time from the arrival of the Jesuits, the Jesuit missionaries, then the Vincentian fathers, the French missionaries in the 19th century, and of course, Hugh Richardson later on, who lived in Lhasa for many years. They were always welcomed. They were welcomed um, as foreigners, but their status was mixed. 
um, they could live within Tibet. They needed a special permission to live within, within Lhasa. They could not acquire property. So the Jesuits could not acquire a house in Lhasa. But the preferred sense given directly in writing to the Jesuits, to the ones who came later, and to Hugh Richardson, was that they would prefer that they join one of the three monasteries. You can see there the centrality. So Father Desideri, the, the Italian Jesuit, comes to Tibet in order to find out about these religions he has heard. The conditions of stay he had were very clear. I'm not too sure I would have liked to follow the conditions. The first one, he was under the protection of the Dalai Lama. The second was that once he was in Lhasa, he could not buy property, so he was given a place. He was asked to join Sera Monastery, so he stayed in Sera for two years, not in a house, not in a hostel, not even in the Dalai Lama's compound, as other guests were. But he, um, he had to stay in Sera, and he was asked at that time to write, to study Buddhism, if he wanted to be in Tibet, and at, at the end of two years, in which he had been instructed by a lama on Tibetan Buddhism prayer and so on, and he was a guest in Sera. I could only think that Sera Monastery in, in, the, in the 17th century must have been very, very cold, especially in winter. Uh, and at the end, he was asked, if you want to remain in Lhasa and in Tibet, you will have to tell me why you think that you would not like to become a Buddhist. So he was not forced to become a Buddhist, but he was asked questions. So he wrote his famous treatise, which for our 21st century eyes is racist, horrible, and so on. But he wrote to the Dalai Lama a full book in which he explained to him, first chapter, I think Tibetans are good people, Buddhism helps people, and I'm very impressed by the monks but you don't have creation. You have not been created. You don't explain the beginning of the world as having a God. So I cannot understand that. Then he said, at the end, I am going to heaven or hell. So therefore, I don't understand why Buddhists are going to do something else. He wrote a very interesting, a very seminal document. And the Dalai Lama asked him to debate. This is, he, he became a monk in Sarah. He was asked to debate at the monastery and then at the court of the Dalai Lama, with the Dalai Lama present in Tibetan, what he did not like about Buddhism. And the debate, he had been two years in Sera, one year to write the, the, the book, and one year of debate, Monday to Friday, he debated with the most senior monks, assessors of the Dalai Lama. At the end, the Dalai Lama said, you are a good man, you can remain in Tibet. So you can see there, you can take it the wrong way and say non-Tibetans were discriminated. You can take it the very good way. A man of letters, a Jesuit, who is well educated, was asked by the Dalai Lama and the Tibetans not to say, I don't like your religion, but to read, to understand, and so forth, and then suggest well, I'm not feeling like following this religion. So about others, I don't know. About Muslims, uh, they were Muslims in Lhasa. They were Hindus in Lhasa. I don't know what they were treated. The, the Hindus had a special position because of the position historical of Buddhism and Hinduism. So uh, some of the Dalai Lamas, the 13th, had a group of masters of Hinduism who came and taught some of the main texts of Hinduism in Lhasa. In the Buddhist world, uh, India and in subcontinent of India, there are mainly two types, Mahayana and Hinayana. So in Tibetan Buddhism, in Tibetan Buddhism, there are four sects. Do you really find that is unifying in nature in future? Yes, yes. Yes, um, uh, if I can recall, I don't know if my wife likes this. Um, um, it's her first time here. 
And certainly our whole sense of, you know, I, 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 I work on Tibetan things and Tibetan scholarship, but I come back here and I leave refreshed, refreshed in my soul. And my wife, who had never been here before, already said to me, we are returning next year in June because she, she, she felt so well around here. And that's why I say, there is, it's not that there is a future in Asia. I, I have the feeling, I began my research in Africa, then I moved to Latin America, I'm in Asia. I want to remain here until I reincarnate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.